And what is my heart's desire? Vengeance. Justice. Fire and blood. Hey guys. So I've made a few videos in the past talking about season eight of Game of Thrones. But truth be told, issues do start even earlier than that. And I want to talk about one issue that happened over and over again, especially in the later seasons of Game of Thrones. And that is fast travel. Here we go. Yeah, if you like the, the shirt, it's, uh, it's appropriate for this episode. Yep, just like fantasy games like Skyrim and The Witcher, it appears that in the world of Game of Thrones, once you've already been to a location, you can just fast travel there and, you know, save yourself a lot of time. This trend in the show first became really apparent at the end of season six of Game of Thrones. In the episode Winds of Winter, Varys seems to go within the span of one episode, all the way from Marine to Sunspear, and back. And while it is cool to see him posing with the rest of the guys as Daenerys plans to invade Westeros, it really begs the question of how the heck is he moving this fast? Now before I really get into it, I want to do a quick shout out to everyone who subscribed and commented and viewed all the videos. Guys, it feels really good to have you here. Thanks for all your support. And yeah, if you haven't joined in yet, um, feel free to jump in. Uh, we'd love to have you uh, as long as you're cool. Let's take a quick segue into talking about how big the world of Game of Thrones actually is. So this is a map of Westeros and Essos, the two continents in Game of Thrones. And they are big, 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 big. Now we don't know fully what the scale of this map is, but we do know one thing, and that's that canonically, the wall is 300 miles long. So using the wall as a yardstick, or in this case, a league stick, we can actually measure the distance between various locations in the world of Game of Thrones. And this puts the distance between Marine and Sunspear to be over 2,400 miles. So just to think about how far apart that is, that is basically the distance between New York and Los Angeles. Or for your Europeans out there, that's basically the distance between Lisbon, Portugal, and Moscow, Russia. And they're not traveling with modern day technology. They are using old, old medieval technology. In modern times, the fastest wind-powered boat that exists today is charted at going at over 65 knots. But they're not using super high-speed competitive sailboats, they're using old-timey frigates. And these frigates would be capped at around 50 knots, which would put the travel time that Varys would have to do as over five days, assuming that he had the right winds blowing him along each way, at his back, in both directions. I mean, it's not likely, right? But, I mean, this is okay, because despite the fact that these scenes were cut together, we don't really have proof that these are meant to happen days apart. And for all we know, these scenes could have happened any amount of time in between them, and so maybe this is all fine. East Watch. Guys, I could talk about this episode by itself for like 45 minutes. Literally nothing makes sense in this episode. I mean, when they take out the first White Walker, why does only one white survive? Why did the Night King just not end everything in one step by just killing Drogon instead of showing off for his friends and aiming for Viserion? And for the love of God, what even is this plan? Why did they think sending the dead down to King's Landing is going to get any support? Does no one here remember that they sent a dead hand down to King's Landing in season one? Ugh. But, but, that's not the point of this video. We're, we're not going to talk about that for now. We're, we're going to put that aside. In the episode East Watch, the fellowship of main characters gets stranded in the north above the wall. And they need to send a message down to Daenerys Targaryen in order to get her to fly back up with her dragons and bail them out. That means that Gendry is going to have to run all the way back down to the wall to send a raven to fly all the way to Dragonstone, and then Daenerys is going to have to hop on her dragons, fly back up to where they are, and pick them up. And this is absolutely insane. Just the raven part, in and of itself, is god dang impossible. The distance between East Watch and Dragonstone is more than 1,800 miles. Comparatively, the fastest speed recorded for a raven is under 50 miles per hour. This means the fastest raven in the world 
going in a straight line between these two points would take over 36 hours to make this flight. And all of our main characters north of the wall are just going to get massacred because there's literally no hope for help to come in time. And this isn't even factoring in the running time, the amount of time Gendry would need to take to get down to the wall, or that Daenerys would need to take in order to fly her dragons back up. It makes literally no sense. I'm okay. I'm calm. I'm calm. I'm calm. I'm calm. I'm not mad. I'm not mad. But where do I get off? I mean, Game of Thrones is a fantasy world. I mean, there are flying dragons, people being brought back from the dead. There's witches. There's magic. There are zombies. I mean, these could be magic teleporting ravens. The dragons could actually be supersonic jets. And the Night King might have some deep entrenched magic that forces him to aim at the furthest targets. Why am I trying to bring math and physics into this? And the reason is simply because it actually does matter. See, we get down to season eight of Game of Thrones, and suddenly there's a big change in the way the world progresses. Events that should take place weeks or months apart are happening almost simultaneously. In one episode, our characters are up in the north in the Battle of Winterfell, and in the very next episode, they're already back down in Dragonstone. And this cuts out so many moments that we needed to see in order for the conclusion to make any sense. One of the scenes that really bothers me about the end of Game of Thrones is Arya and the Hound talking in the middle of the Red Keep. And in this moment, the Hound convinces Arya to give up her plight on revenge. But guys, they've been riding on horseback all the way down the King's Road from the north. This is a multi-week long journey. Have they not talked about anything this entire time? They literally would have rode past the twins. The Hound would have had questions about what the hell happened to all the phrase. And this doesn't even come up. But let's talk about other stories that we completely missed out on because fast travel was so goddamn apparent in this final season. Let's talk about how Sansa managed to become well-respected in the North, finally getting the title as queen because of how smart and good she was as a ruler that we really never saw. Let's talk about how Brienne dealt with having succeeded in her mission to protect the two daughters of Catelyn Stark, and the new discovery that Gendry is now the Lord of Storm's End, the kingdom to which Brienne now belongs to as Tarth is a part of the Stormlands. Let's talk about what Bran told Tyrion, a story that must have been really interesting and compelled all the Seven Kingdoms to learn about the importance of the Three-Eyed Raven. Hell, it must have been a good story. After all, it seems to be a story that Tyrion thought was so important got him nominated to be king. And who has a better story than Bran the Broken? And there's Daenerys, where we spent no time talking about how she felt about the death of Viserion, the death of Sir Jorah Marmont, the death of Rhaegal, and then the death of Missandei. The slow reveal of how the Seven Kingdoms dealt with the discovery that Aegon Targaryen was still alive. Flushing out these plot lines and giving them more time to breathe would allow us to make more sense of Daenerys' eventual turn on the people of Westeros, deciding that there was no love for her there, and deciding to destroy King's Landing. Instead, because of the fast travel that these characters were doing over and over again, these changes, these character arcs came out of nowhere, leaving us with a sense of what is going on and where did this come from? It's not like the point of Game of Thrones was to shock and surprise us, right? I said, well, what do, what do I do with that? What do I do with that? The, yeah, these people have guessed the secret that I'm going to reveal in book six. People have already guessed that here and book two is just out. You really have two choices there. You can ignore it and proceed with your plan, despite the fact that some people know where you're going. Or you can get all panicky and say, oh my God, they figured it out. I can't let that be. I'll have to change it. I'll have to go in a different direction. And I, th I think some writers do that. It's almost felt like the writers had somewhere else to be and were just trying to get out of there. I think it stands to say that if there had just been more breathing time in the last couple seasons, season 7 and season 8 of Game of Thrones, if they threw more episodes in where really not much had to happen, just characters talking, interacting, 
really dwelling on moments past to give those moments time to breathe, we would have felt that the ending that Game of Thrones provided would have been earned and deserved instead of the way we all feel about it now. Uh, but anyways, guys, that's just what I think. Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below, and I'll see you in the next episode. Bye.